Welcome to Bladed Tech Musings, the channel dedicated to retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. With SpaceX's historic first commercial manned space flight, we thought it would be instructive to get NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine's take on the roles his agency, SpaceX, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin performed in the intervening time between Boeing's initial award in 2010 for commercial crew development and 2020's return of American astronauts being launched to space on American spacecraft. Bridenstine was a controversial pick by President Trump to head NASA in 2017 due to his targeting of climate change spending by the Obama administration during his tenure as congressman from Oklahoma and his lack of academic background in engineering. He was confirmed on a straight party line vote. Nevertheless, Bridenstine has largely received bipartisan praise for his handling of NASA since his appointment, including for the areas concerning climate change. In particular, the NASA administrator has been tough on both SpaceX and Boeing on meeting promised development schedules while insisting on crew safety certifications, all under a fixed price contract environment. While Bridenstine's handling of the Orion and SLS programs still faces tough tests in the near future, the SpaceX launch of the Dragon 2 Demo 2 man capsule is unquestionably his tenure's highlight to date. In this first segment, Bridenstine lauds the cooperation between SpaceX and NASA during the preparation and conduct of the first manned U.S. commercial launch. He also stresses the importance of NASA's strategy in opening up space to competition to promote innovation and cost effectiveness, and the need for the space industry to encourage both government and commercial demand for their services. So obviously NASA has made huge investments into the International Space Station. So we're largely focused on the International Space Station, but we are also the customer for this launch. So as the mission management team goes through the countdown sequence, we're going to have NASA engineers and NASA flight directors that are going to be um, side by side with the, with the SpaceX engineers and flight directors. And, and um, if at any point we feel uncomfortable with the direction that they're going, of course, we can, we can halt the launch. But what NASA is trying to do right now, we are trying to create a robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. That's the goal, which means we need SpaceX to go get customers that are not NASA. We want to be a customer, but we want to be one of many customers. So what we're doing is we're giving SpaceX a lot of leash. In fact, we have contracted for them to actually do the launch almost independently. Um, but make no mistake, our engineers and our technicians have been involved in the development of this capability. Um, and our, our astronauts have been involved in it. Um, so again, we want to be one customer of many. Um, we, are, we are helping to grow this commercial marketplace um, by being a tenant customer initially. But we also want to have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation and safety. Um, and when we achieve that, it's going to transform how we do spaceflight. It's going to bring down costs and it's going to increase access. In the second segment, Bridenstine discusses the folly of the U.S. space industry relying on both demand and supply from the U.S. government and why commercial opportunities will drive demand separately from that of government priorities. Yeah, at this point, um, the history has been that government creates the demand and then government creates the supply. And so what we're doing here is we're trying to change that paradigm. Um, certainly, we are creating the demand and we're turning to commercial industry to give us the supply. Um, but again, what we want to see eventually um, is the demand would come from others as well. Um, and so what are we doing right now? We're using the International Space Station to do things like we're, we're creating human organs in 3D, printing human organs in 3D using adult stem cells. Right now, it's just tissue, but eventually it's going to be full organs. And we can only do that in the microgravity of space. If you try to do it on Earth, the tissue just goes flat. But then, of course, it's not just that. It's also using advanced materials to create artificial retinas for the human eyeball. So somebody who has macular degeneration doesn't have to lose their eyesight. It's advanced materials like uh, fiber optics. that are it's, You can create fiber optics in such a pristine way that you don't have to have repeaters, which drives down the cost for fiber optics, and it closes the business case for manufacturing in space. Um, we're compounding pharmaceuticals in a way that you cannot do in the gravity well of Earth. We're, we're creating immunizations that you cannot create in the gravity well of Earth. 
So these are all different markets that, that we are proving out on the International Space Station, knowing that eventually there's going to be a large capital influx, not just for launch, which is what we're doing today, but also for human habitation in space. Um, and that's really the end state that we're seeking to achieve. In segment three, Bridenstine explains why SpaceX has been certified for manned spaceflight before Boeing and its commercial Starliner capsule, and the importance of maintaining multiple sources for commercial spacecraft. So uh, the Boeing and SpaceX uh, uh, paradigm, I'll talk about that first. Um, so remember, SpaceX was doing commercial resupply of the International Space Station, and they were largely doing it with a lot of the same equipment that they're now, now going to be doing commercial crew with. Boeing did not participate in commercial resupply. So Boeing went straight from nothing to commercial crew. So that's a, that's a lot harder of a starting position. And so, yes, they, they, are, they are a little bit behind right now. Um, and, of course, it, it costs us a little more to get them ramped up because of their, 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 their starting position. That being said, we are committed to having two partners in this, in this future that we, that we envision. But we also believe this is important. There are other companies right now that are stepping up the, to the plate that want to be part of this. Sierra Nevada Corporation, Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos's organization. So there's other partners out there on the horizon uh, for, this, for this commercial marketplace eventuality. In segment four, Bridenstine discusses how commercial crew launches allows for the rebalancing of the Russian-American partnership at the ISS by moving away from hefty seat fees on Soyuz rockets to cooperating on astronaut and cosmonaut manifests in the future. That's right. So when we think about the International Space Station, half of it is the United States segment with all of our international partners, and the other half of it is the Russian segment. Um, so if we want to make sure that we keep it crude with both Americans and Russians, then it will be appropriate for us for Americans to launch on Soyuz rockets and for Russians to launch on commercial crew rockets. Now, that being said, the difference is, instead of us going out and buying seats at $90 million a piece, um, now we're gonna be able to do a no exchange of funds trade, which is a very different, it makes it more of a partnership and less of a dependency. So we like the partnership, we wanna, we wanna get ourselves off of the dependency. In this final fifth segment, Bridenstine enthuses about the upcoming Artemis mission to the moon, why commercial spaceflight has enabled manned spaceflight in general, and how space is to be accessible to anyone. Oh, it's big. So what we're doing is we're driving down costs and we're increasing access to space. And we, as much as we love Apollo, the problem with Apollo is that it ended. Well, it just so happens that in Greek mythology, Apollo had a twin sister. Her name was Artemis. And we are going to the moon, this time sustainably, under the Artemis program, named after the twin sister of Apollo. This time when we go, we have a very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women. We're going to go sustainably. We're going to go with commercial partners, international partners. We're going to use the resources of the moon, namely hundreds of millions of tons of water ice, to learn how to live and work for long periods of time. We're going to take that knowledge all the way to Mars. So. Um, so what we've proven today is the business model. How do we make it work um, from a business model perspective? And we're applying that to the moon right now. We just went under contract uh, with three commercial companies to deliver American astronauts to the surface of the moon commercially. Do you agree with Bridenstine's assessment of NASA, the commercial space industry, and the agency's moon ambitions? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this discussion of the commercial crew development and Orion Artemis programs that are contemporary to the SpaceX Dragon 2 Demo 2 launch. If so, click the like button. We would like to take a moment to thank our subscribers for helping us reach the 2000 subscriber milestone. Not a subscriber yet? Clicking the subscribe button and the bell notification icon will help both our YouTube standing and keep you informed when new episodes are released. Links to previous space industry related episodes and our other content can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure you follow our Twitter account where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page 
where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching.